Okay. Anyway, so <clears throat> this Sunday we uh, had the opportunity to listen to a reading from the book of the prophet Micah. <clears throat> and just like Baruch and Zephaniah of the last two weeks, uh, we don't hear often from Micah. I, I happen to like Micah a lot because um, his message is really, really very clear and powerful. Um, but he's, he's someone we don't hear much from. If, if those of you who have your little timelines, if you look at your timeline, you'll see that he prophesied right around the time as Isaiah did. Aha. Uh -huh. Great. Jeannie is joining us. Great. Hello, Jeannie. Jeannie. Hello. Jeannie. Ah, you made it. You made it. Good for you. You're <laughs> muted. You're, you're, on, you're on mute. Jeannie, you're on mute. Jeannie, you're on mute. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Sylvia, so good to see you too. This is wonderful. <laughs> My computer is crazy, so there I you are. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's just your just it's just your computer, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and I've got my breakfast over here. So. Good for you. Good for you. Enjoy. Good, good. I can see oh, the Montana's uh, been reading from 101 pastor jokes. <laughs> Great, good. Okay, so uh, the prophet Micah, you, you notice, prophesied right around the same time as Isaiah did. Now, pay attention. If you look at your little your little chart, right here in this bottom right-hand corner, there are a lot of prophets. Isaiah, Micah, Zephaniah, Nahum, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk. Uh, <clears throat> now, you might think, well, that's wonderful. Well, no, no. Remember, the reason God sent prophets was because we needed to listen to him. Uh, he, he had to send people to to call us to pay attention once again. And so we see this proliferation of prophets at a time when the people of, the, of Judah were just not listening to God and they were they were getting set in their ways. And it, it's, it's something that I reflect on frequently. I can make sure that, that I, I'm paying attention. Am I getting set in my ways or am I always ready and willing to listen to something new that, that God has in for me. So um, the prophet Micah uh, was one of those who came, was sent uh, because the people needed to listen to a new message. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the very beginning of the book of the prophet Micah, uh, Jeannie, that would, that, yeah. would be, that would be on page... <laughs> 1282 for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know I'm sort of handicapped. So. <laughs> we all have our limitations. Yeah. And I'm just, just glad that you can join us. So if you look at the very beginning of the book of the prophet Micah, it says, The word of the Lord which came to Micah of Morasheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. So you'll notice right in the chart, it's, it speaks of um, uh, Jotham. Uh, I'm sorry. Jotham is another name for, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. You see Jotham right there, Ahaz and Hezekiah. So we, he identifies exactly when he is speaking. <clears throat> And it says here that which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Now pay attention, Samaria and Jerusalem. We all, we all know that Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. What was Samaria? Don't all answer at once. The northern kingdom? Exactly, exactly. Samaria was the capital. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Exactly, so, so his prophecy is for both Samaria and Jerusalem, both for the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, you know, the northern kingdom had already been absorbed into, into the Assyrian kingdom, but the people there were still part of God's plan. And so we see the prophet Micah calling them back as well. <clears throat> uh, there's only one other reference to Micah in all of the sacred scripture, and that's found in the book of the prophet 
Jeremiah. Let's quickly shoot, hold Micah, don't lose Micah. Let's shoot back to Jeremiah. <clears throat> and what page would that be? I'll, I'll have it for you in just a minute. It's page 1107. I don't have my bulletin from last week, so. <laughs> <laughs> In Jeremiah 27, uh, I'm sorry, J Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah 26, verse 17. Laura, how about reading that? <clears throat> Uh, in fact, why, why, this is a very interesting um, uh, little passage in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. This is when uh, Jeremiah is on trial and they, they want to kill him. And so here we see this, this very interesting conversation going on, uh, starting with verse 16. You're, you're muted. No wonder you didn't answer my question. <laughs> oh, what was your question? <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought maybe uh, maybe you were busy finding the page. I was just curious. Wasn't there another prophet that we read recently that Jeremiah mentioned in his? Like I feel like Deja yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, like Zephaniah. I think you're right. I, I, we just we just 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 last week. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. Okay. So he knew these other people? Like they all lived at, they, I thought they lived at different times or I guess. Well, well no, no they're, 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 all, they're all contemporaries. Okay. Yeah, but Jeremiah. Uh, 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 yeah, Jeremiah would have been the same time as Zephaniah. Okay. Um, and Micah is referred to, let, let's look at this. Uh, they're referring to Micah from an earlier time. Okay. Yeah. Look. Then the princes and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, "This man does not deserve a death sentence." And it, they're referring. They're referring to Jeremiah here. Okay. It is in the name of the Lord our God that He speaks to us. Okay. Now pay, atten now pay attention here. So there's a conversation going on. Or he's on trial, basically, and the priests and and. Uh, uh, the, the priests and the other prophets, remember they had all kinds of other prophets in those days, want to put him to death. So here the princes of Jerusalem and the people are saying, no, he shouldn't be put to death because he speaks in the name of the Lord our God. Okay, so, so at least Jeremiah has some um, supporters. Keep going. At this, some of the elders of the land arose and said to the whole assembly of the people, Micah of Morasheth, used to prophesy in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he said to all the people of Judah, thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem a heap of ruins, and the temple mount a forest ridge. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah condemn him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord so that the Lord had a change of heart regarding the evil he had spoken against them. We, however, are about to do great evil against ourselves. Okay, so here we see that in a court case, there's, they're saying, look, we, we've got precedence here. We didn't like what Micah said, and yet we didn't put him to death. So just because we don't like what Jeremiah says, we shouldn't put him to death too. Okay, so, so Micah is used in, in a court case against Jeremiah. Very interesting. But it's important because it identifies this Micah of Morasheth prophesying during the time of Hezekiah. So we see in another passage that Micah did actually exist and that he, his prophecy uh, was of great importance. Okay, So although he's a minor prophet uh, and one that we don't know much about or, or hear much about, uh, he was important in, in the days of, of ancient Israel. And that's why it would make sense for uh, what we'll hear in, in today's gospel, a reference to him. So, uh, <clears throat> Monsignor, did these prophets, any of them know one another or know of one another? 
Laura, I just asked that same question, and, and the answer is yes. That, that's, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. Um, uh, in fact, for example, we see here that Jeremiah, uh, the people in the time of Jeremiah, re remembered Micah. Micah lived before Jeremiah, but Isaiah and Mike and Micah were were contemporaries. Okay. And so they they could very well have known each other because Micah leaves. <clears throat> Um, uh, Moresheth in order to go to Jerusalem and Isaiah was prophesying in Jerusalem so they could very well have known each other. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. <clears throat> now part of the, uh, the, the, the part of the section that we're going to read again prepares us for the gospel so it's a, it's a very short little passage but it helps us to understand what it is that is happening in the little town of Bethlehem. Okay, so let's look at Micah. Go back to Micah 5. <clears throat> that's 1287. That, I'm sorry, that's 1287 for you, uh, Peggy. <laughs> Chapter 5, just the first four verses there. <clears throat> but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, least among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel. Okay, stop, stop right there. Lots of little, little bits of tidbits of information here, okay? Um, first of all, it talks about Bethlehem Ephrathah. Ephrathah, <clears throat> if you look at the little footnotes there. <clears throat> Oh no, I'm sorry. Sorry, not 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 in the footnote there. Let's let's turn to Ruth, the book of Ruth. That's really far back. You're absolutely right. That's right after Judges. Ruth is way back. Yeah, right after Judges. Jeannie, that's on page three twenty-seven for you. Oh, three twenty-seven. Way back, yeah, yeah. Now we all know what the word Bethlehem means. What does Bethlehem mean? House of bread. Exactly. That's a very good, good. Beth, Beth means house. Lechem means uh, means bread. Okay. But what does it mean again, Monsignor? What house is, of bread. House of bread. They probably had a lot of bakeries there or something. Speaking of which, I don't know if you read in the, in the Inquirer this morning, I was reading in Turkey, they're having a terrible problem. The, the, the economy is so bad, yeah. uh, they can't even afford to buy bread. And bread, if, if, ever, if ever you've been to Turkey, they have this, this wonderful sweet bread with coriander seeds and sesame seeds. Oh, it's delicious. Um, but their 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 inflation has gotten so bad uh, that they 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 simply can't even afford to buy bread. That's so so pray for the people in Turkey. Anyway, so house of bread um, in Ruth one one we see this very interesting passage. Go ahead, uh, Laura. Once back in the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem of Judah left home with his wife and two sons to reside on the plateau of Moab. Okay, so here we see even back then in the time of Ruth, there's this message, this, this uh, mention of the, the town of Bethlehem. Okay, keep going. The man was named Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and his sons Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem of Judah. Okay, so what's, what's an Ephrathite? Someone from Ephrath. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> Ephratha is simply the Moabite name of Bethlehem. Just as, for example, Chaldea and Babylon are the same, the names, names for the same town. Uh, Jacob and Israel, names, two, two names for the same person. So here you have Bethlehem, Ephratha, just being identified uh, by by two names, okay? And the reason he does this, let, let's go back to Micah. 
to make it very clear to everybody who's listening to this message, uh, including the Samaritans who might know Bethlehem by the name of Ephrathah, not Bethlehem. Uh, uh, that that's the town they're talking about. Okay, so so Mike is wanting to be very very clear about what this town is. Oh, and another reason for that is because there is in in the ancient uh, Israelite world another Bethlehem up in Cana, uh, up in the land of Cana further north. So um, making sure that everybody knows that which Bethlehem he's talking about. Okay. I, I once saw a show that said there were actually three Bethlehems. Ah, very good. You're absolutely right. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting where the third Bethlehem was. Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it was in the Jordan area. But I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm you're but right. the one where Jesus was born, they have that plaque on the house. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus slept here. Yes. <laughs> Along with George Washington. Right, exactly. Just one of those things. <laughs> and they knew each other, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Anyway, <laughs> back from myth into reality. So anyway, so here we are talking about this, this little town. Um, and it's, it's of great significance because, although it's the least of the clans of Judah, for you shall come forth... Now pay attention here. It says here we're back. We're back in Micah. Micah, Micah one. Micah, Micah chapter one, chapter five, verse one. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel. What, what's this for me? Well, didn't the kings always like they were always chosen by God, like they were. Isn't he talking as the state of Israel? I mean, as the religious in Israel at that point? He, he's not talking about himself as an individual, is he? Who be he? Micah? No, God. Oh. <laughs> he's speaking for God. Yeah, remember, notice... Uh, Micah is speaking as a prophet, so he is speaking the word of God. Okay. And so he's saying, from you shall come forth for me. Remember, God made us for himself. So his plan is always to have us rejoined to himself. And so part of this 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 next chapter of the plan is the fulfillment of getting us back to himself. So it is part of God's plan, for he wants us to be with him. So it, it, one who is to be the ruler of Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. Now, ooh, isn't that interesting? Whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. Hmm. Who could that possibly be? Sounds like the word. There, precisely, precisely, exactly. The word was God. The word was with God. So here we see already in the prophet Micah an allusion to the second person of the Blessed Trinity. In obtuse lang such obtuse language, they certainly wouldn't get it, but we immediately see that. Ah, yes. One whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. Okay. Great. Good. Were they talking about Jesus? Then? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Uh, although he, they would not know that. Yeah. But the but the language as we look at it today, the the clues are pretty powerful there. If if you understand it. Okay. Good. So just just to clarify, so Bethlehem Ephrathah, it's called Ephrathah because Moabites came there, and that's the Moabite name. Uh, let's let's do it the other way around. Uh, it, it's probably it was originally a Moabite a part of the Moabite nation that when the when the Israelites when Israel moved in there they gave it their name. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the Moabites were there first. They were there first, just like the okay. Indians here in America. Yes, yes. It's just called Bethlehem Ephrathah. 
it should be effort of Bethlehem. I mean, it ah, can't be yeah, yeah. Well, well, more people would know it know it as Bethlehem. At least more, okay. more of the people of this particular audience would know it. Right. So, Monsignor, just a minute. The, the prophets are talking, but they're not understand what they're saying because whose origin is from of old, from ancient times. They didn't know about Jesus. They're just oh. talking about. Really good comment there, Peggy. Often the prophets are saying things, and it's only years, generations later, that people come to understand the fullness of the message. Oh, you're absolutely right. Huh. Well, wouldn't wouldn't people have thought the prophets were a little silly? I mean, if you, I mean, people, if I if I walk around talking, and yeah. people have no idea what I'm talking about, and it doesn't make really sense to them, and neither do I. Was that a personal thing, Peggy? No. <laughs> no. Let's not talk it's about my... you in the classroom, Jim. <laughs> my name is Jeannie. <laughs> oh, it says Chris Peg. Yeah, yeah, that's my son. Oh, okay, I think that's him. He's coming. I'll have to go. I have to. I'll be right there. He thinks coming to fix my iPad. But I would. I would think the prophets would have been ridiculed by a lot of people. Well, they were absolutely here as we saw with jeremiah they wanted to kill him yeah so uh, and and what makes it even more uh confusing and, and that's that's why we really have to have a lot of patience and understanding for the people these were one among in some cases hundreds of prophets and the other prophets would all be going in this direction and Jeremiah and, and, and people like Mike would say, no, you need to go in that direction. Well, who wants to go in that direction? Everybody else is going in this direction. So, oh, yeah, it, it's, um, you know, we can look at it today with great wisdom and say, oh, yeah, yeah, how would they miss it? They will miss it because it's like us with our pandemic right now. What's the real message? What should we really be doing? Where, what direction should we really be following? We, we're getting all kinds of mixed messages. The same would be the case. Yeah, we can't get on. We... Okay, good. Thank you. Anyway, okay, so... I'll tell them to send it to you. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> Monsignor, that was Linda BC. She didn't get the information. She can't get on Zoom. I'll the send it to her. Yeah. Thanks, I'll, Laura. Except Thanks. that I'm reading. I'll, I'll do it right. Right? Am I, do I have much more to read? <laughs> oh, that's right. You read. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take over. It's only a few more verses. Okay. Uh, verse, verse two. You know, Jim, how about you reading it? So, therefore, the Lord will give them up until the time when she who is to give birth has born, and the rest of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. You know, now stop right there. Again, a very important passage. Notice what it says. The Lord will give them up. Uh, we know that that's exactly what happened. For a while, it seemed as if God has just kind of abandoned his people and allowed them to be taken over, first the northern kingdom by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. But then at the appointed time, when she who is to give birth has born, that's referring <clears throat> for the people of ancient Israel, they would think of that as being Israel, but we know it speaks of Mary. Then the rest of his kingdom shall return to the children of Israel. So here we see again the message is given not only to Judah, but to all of Israel, Samaria. Okay, so um, it's it's a call back for everybody. Okay, keep going. He shall stand firm and shepherd his flock by the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord, his God. And they shall remain for now his greatness and they and they shall remain for now his greatness shall reach to the ends of the earth okay. he shall so here, here we see here we see this wonderful image again we see this frequently throughout the old testament as the the anointed one ah linda you're joining us good good um uh, being being cast into the image of a shepherd a wonderful shepherd who leads his flock <clears throat> and they shall dwell securely, for now his greatness shall reach to the ends of the earth. And now again we see a sign of universal salvation. Again, as, as early as the time of Isaiah and Micah, 
we see this message of universal salvation being presented. It's not just for the people of Israel, although they're the chosen people, everyone is to be saved. So it's a, it's a very short, but very, very packed message. Got that? Great, good. Okay, that prepares us then for Luke's gospel. Let's turn to Luke. You know, I can't believe that these prophets are talking and they don't understand what they're talking about. I mean, uh, it, it's, it, it's... Oh, okay, well, let, 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 me, let me be a little clearer about this. They think they know what they're talking about, but, but their message is for uh, a king um, that would be uh, anointed like, oh. king, like King David. They, they were oh. looking to establish a kingdom here in this world, and uh, they would always understand it from that lens. And so, oh, okay. so their oh. message makes sense to them, but mm -hmm. from, for us, it has a much more much yeah. more powerful uh, focus, okay? Okay. Great. Linda, I'm sorry you couldn't get on. Did, 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 didn't Jeannie tell you that we were meeting remotely? <laughs> I did. I told her yesterday. Uh, okay, Didn't I? Linda, she's on mute. Linda, you're on mute. <laughs> Linda, save me. I told you yesterday. <laughs> I told you yesterday, Linda. <laughs> You're on you, mute. Did tell me, you did tell me yesterday. I didn't know the time change, so I'm late. I know that now. Yeah. There was no time change. There was no time change? No, there was no time change. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But you're here. That's fine. Good to have you here. Good. Thank you. Okay. So we're now on, on Luke. Um, <clears throat> for the last two weeks, we've been focusing on John the Baptist, who would foretell the coming of the Lord. Now we're back to Jesus and, and his birth in preparation for his birth. Um, <clears throat> now, as, as, we, as we get ready for Christmas, we realize that this is a time of year for family stories, the, the well-worn, deeply loved stories that remind us of who we are. You know, when we gather around at Christmas, uh, we, we tell stories about our families and remember the past and all this and that sort of well, this is a, a wonderful way for time for us to remember that God sent his son into our family. And there are some really important stories for us that we need to remember. And this is another one of those. And it has to do with the, the encounter between Mary and Elizabeth. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a story of, of two mothers to be, one who was thought to be beyond childbearing age, and one who still didn't know man, one who was a very young woman, a maiden, uh, betrothed, but not yet married. So, and this is their first child. <clears throat> now, for those of you who are mothers, and you remember your first child, you remember all the anxieties that you had. I, as I told you, I just, just had the privilege of uh, <clears throat> have, uh, having the uh, my 11th, Grand, uh, my 11th great nephew being born and this is their first child and it's it's fun watching them you know <laughs> when, when I do baptisms I, I always tell them make sure you have a pacifier with you just in case the baby gets and you know it's, if it's the first child and the, the baby spits it out they quickly run to the diaper bag and get a new one if it's, if it's the second child uh, they'll, they'll pick it up pick it and up. pick it off and stick it back, it back in. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> you know, it's, it's the third child. They put it in chloroform. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so it's it's, uh, but this so this is the first for both of them, and you can imagine the level of concern and anxiety, and at the same time excitement. So it's it's a it's a lovely lovely story. Okay, uh, Joanne, how about reading that? Oh, the Luke birth of one, Jesus. Luke 1, starting with verse 39. Luke 1, 39. Okay. During these days, Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Okay, now, so it's, so it's during those days. Uh, Luke, Luke uses um, this, this technique to speak of something important happening over and over again in Luke's gospel, 
if you say things like during those days or at that time, it's, it's kind of like in our fairy tales when we say once upon a time. It's a time that you need to pay attention to. So it's during those days, it's, it's kind of his code for saying this is an important moment. Okay. And we see that uh, Mary set out in haste. You know, she had just learned that, that she was pregnant and she had learned at that same time from the angel Gabriel that, that Elizabeth was pregnant. And so you can imagine that in her excitement, she wanted to share the good news. Um, and it, it's to a town of, of um, in haste to a town of Judah. Those of you who were on the, on the uh, uh, pilgrimage uh, a few years ago, you'll recall we, we stopped in this little town uh, where Elizabeth lived. Cute little tucked away uh, town south, south west of, of Jerusalem. Now we drove in our bus and it still took us some time. Can you imagine walking there from Bethlehem down to there? Uh, but little Mary did that. Um, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And so we all know about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah was one of the, one of the, the high priests and he was the one who um, doubted what happened when it was announced to him that Elizabeth uh, would have a child. Um, <clears throat> but here we see Elizabeth. We, we, we never hear about how Elizabeth responds when she learns that she's pregnant. Okay. But, but here we get a sense that she's understanding that something special is happening because we, we hear in verse 41, Joanne. Okay. And Zechariah was struck dumb, wasn't he? When yeah. he, he doubted. Precisely. Yes, yes, he, he doubted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud, loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Okay. Stop right there. <clears throat> now, the word leaped is, is, a, is, is used very, very carefully. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Luke here is not using uh, the, the language that would speak of the normal movement of a child in the womb. Again, those of you who have had kids you know how the little ones kick in your womb. Well, th this word here really could be translated as danced. And now some pregnant women say that their kids dance in their womb too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's, 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 a, it's a really exciting um kind of excited kind of movement okay sounds uh, like david dancing before the ark of the covenant well yeah there you go there you go yes yes yeah good so john, this, john was twerking <laughs> there you go so this family story makes its first theological point john even before he was born was prophetic in drawing attention to the good news of the coming of Jesus. He couldn't wait to share it, so he was dancing, okay? Like, like King David in front of the ark. Yeah, yeah, so. um, and then notice it says here, Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. Clearly, it, it's, it's a movement of the Spirit. It's not Elizabeth on her own. She knows this only because of some divine inspiration. So she cries out in a loud voice, most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Another, another indication to the Immaculate Conception of, G, of Mary. Most blessed are you among women. So uh, women are all blessed, you know that. Uh, but she was most blessed among women. And in the same way, the fruit of her womb, the child, is, is blessed, okay? So we're seeing here some very deep theological statements already being made just in this momentary greeting. Go ahead. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, pay attention here. This is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> again, unfortunately, uh, CNN wasn't there. So this, this isn't being recorded uh, as if it actually happened. This is a theological treatise that Luke is presenting to us. And we do him a disservice by trying to say, well, that's what Elizabeth said. No, that's not what Elizabeth said. Uh, Luke, Luke is trying to help his, his listeners from the very beginning recognize who this child is. 
uh, the mother of my Lord should come to me. So already we're seeing this theological proclamation made by Luke that Jesus was indeed God from the very beginning. Now, this would be important later on because, as you know, in the early Christian community, there, there were all kinds of heresies, all kinds of struggles with understanding who Jesus was. Was he divine from the beginning or did he, did he become divine? Was he really truly God? Was he truly man? So Luke allows us um, some, some very important information very early on in his gospel. Say, yes, uh, this is God himself. Uh, you see that? So it's, it's, you know, we, we say, well, you know, Mary said this. No, no. Or Elizabeth said this. No, no. These, these are theological statements made by, by the gospel writers to assure their audience decades later. Okay. I think it's just so hard. I mean, I know that's what you've been teaching us for the last so many Ten years. years. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guess I just, I just remember reading it like it was just a story, like it was just a cute little story. <laughs> like I never really thought about reading into any of it. In fact, the part where it's this mother of my Lord, it, it's kind of like in the Hail Mary you know, mother of God. Um, I remember I used to always struggle with that because I, 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 I may be so bold. I think this goes back to a point that Monsignor made earlier. I think when we read and hear of these things, it's part of this complacency. When we hear something so often, we don't really think about it. And we tend to rush through it. I think that happens a lot. I mean, one of the beauties of the Catholic church is the ritual but by the same token, since it is a ritual, we forget how deep meaning it is. I mean, I mean, just think of when we say the creed. Each one of those sentences is beautiful in and of itself, but we just rip through it and we don't really think about it. So I think it's the same thing when we read. Yes, it, it is a story in an anecdotal sense, but when we go through Bible study and we examine each line and really think about what it means. You can meditate on each, each one of these lines. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I guess yeah. there's just not really a transition. I mean, like I just remember being a kid and you learn the stories, but there was no part two, like when you get to high school or whatever, like, do you see where I'm going with this? Like there, mm, I think mm. that's there was never true. like, I mean, until 40 years later, I go to my senior's Bible study, you know. <laughs> right, but that's one of the issues with our faith. For all of us, we kind of, you know, a lot of people after First Communion or Confirmation, that's it, press pause. And we're lucky if anybody presses pause again to pick it up. I mean, that's why we're blessed to have this Bible study. But a lot of people have pressed pause at Confirmation, and they don't repress pause. It never goes back to play. Wow. Good, good, really, really good, really good comparison. Um, let, let, let me respond uh, uh, to what you said, Laura. Um, I, as you know, I went to enter the seminary when I was 13, but I went to, went to uh, Archfield Carroll High School for one year as a senior, because when we moved from California to here, the minor seminary had just closed here at St. Charles the year before. And I remember being in their, their religion class uh, and, it was it was uh, Houston Smith. Do any do any, any of you remember World Religions by Houston Smith? The first edition was a really brilliant, brilliant um, comparison of various religions. The second his second edition is terrible. Uh, he tried to he tried to abbreviate it and he missed all kinds of points. But the the, the chapter in in Houston's uh, Houston Smith's book on Christianity and it's really a wonderful, good, powerful composite of our faith. Well, I remember the poor teacher trying to present it to these high school kids, and they didn't want to hear it. They, 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 and, and he was saying this very same thing. I remember saying, oh, yeah, I learned this as a freshman in, in, at the seminary. He was trying to show them the theological message here. They didn't want to hear it. So... Um, we do, I think we try, but as I've said before, it's, it's not until, until we need God that we then listen to him. 
And that's why we're privileged now in a time when we recognize that we need God, that he speaks to us. And every, every three years, we have the opportunity to hear this message again. And every time we have the opportunity to hear it differently and often more deeply. But God is a gentle God usually, and he invites us. And it's in our need that we then turn to him. Does that, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I, I think also maybe it's a an issue of like the stages of faith development where the person is still uh, in that group mode and they're not they haven't personalized their faith yet, so they they're not able to to look at it in a deeper way. Oh, you're, you're right on target. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from the relationship the relationship with God, I think, is not much different than it is from the relationship of a child to their parent. When they're when you're young, mm. you you need your parent, you believe everything they tell you, and then you hit that stage where you can't imagine your parents are as stupid as they really are. Mm. And because you know so much more, and then later you find out, oh my God, <laughs> they they were right. And I really don't know, and I still don't know. Well, mm. isn't that a line from Mark Twain? When my I went away to college for four years, and when I came back, I couldn't believe how smart my parents were. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, good, good, really good, really good comparisons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Anyway, so 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 these are theological statements. So so catch them on their theological level. <clears throat> go ahead. Um, okay. John. For at the moment, the sound of your greeting reached my ears. The infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. Okay, so here we have, again, um, Elizabeth speaking in in theological terms, saying how blessed Mary is, uh, who believed that what was spoken to her by the Lord would be fulfilled. Uh, She was a young, she was a very young woman, uh, and yet she put her trust in God. Uh, <clears throat> and because of her, great things were able to happen. So, so what are we seeing here? Hmm. Um, in, in the first reading, we're seeing that, that Bethlehem, this little absolutely nothing town, was going to be the source of the new Messiah. Uh, and, and we see that in God's plan frequently, don't we? That God does things in unexpected ways through unexpected people. Uh, going back, let's say, going all the way back to um, uh, David, who was the youngest son of, of um, oh dear, what's his father's name? Saul? Jesse. Jesse. Um, or, or we have um, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the younger son, so he should not have been the one to become the, 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 the great uh, patriarch. So God works in unexpected ways, and we need to find him in those unexpected ways. Um, and Monsignor, that is such a great point. And I think, once again, we live in such an open society now that it's hard to understand the context. But think of it this way. Up until, I think, 10 or 15 years ago, the only person who become monarch in the UK was the firstborn son. So it took them, what, 700 years to figure out if the firstborn was a female. And if you're the secondborn of any gender, you're out. So the fact that the point you made is an excellent one, that the youngest son, who was a nobody, was chosen as a prophet, that's big news. You're absolutely right. You're, and, and, and it's important for us to realize that, that, that God works in these unexpected ways and we have to be open to his working uh, to each one of us uh, in in these surprising sometimes disturbing certainly unusual <laughs> okay which then leads us to the the second reading from the book of hebrews hebrews 10 
Now, here in Hebrews 10, we see the, the, the task that Jesus is called to perform. Uh, you know, at, at Christmas time, we, we spend a lot of time focusing on the, the cute idea of, of him being born in, in a manger in Bethlehem and is not lovely. And angels uh, announce his coming and shepherds come and adore him and kings come and worship before him. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, he came for a purpose. There was a task that he was to perform. Wow. What was that? <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and what was that task that he was to perform? Um, now, let's, let's again go back to the world into which he was born. How did, how did the people of his day understand their relationship with God? Uh, they had a temple in Jerusalem, and they were called to go and worship their God in the temple, uh, four or five times a year. Uh, and how did they worship their God? By offering sacrifices. Um, and the, the, the whole uh, temple cult was based on this notion of sacrifice. Uh, you, you would go and uh, you, you'd bring your unblemished lamb, or if you didn't have an unblemished lamb, you'd buy one at, in, the, in the court outside of the temple. And then you would bring that to the priest who would then offer, the, offer that as a sacrifice. Um, so then Jesus comes and he literally overturns the carts. You know, he, he chases out the money changers. He throws out uh, all, the, all the, the, the merchants. Why? Because he has a, he, he's come to present a whole new message. And we see that uh, foretold here in the letter to the Hebrews. Okay, uh, but how about reading this? Chapter ten, verses five. Let, let, let's start from the very beginning of, of uh, chapter ten because it gives us the, the, the background here. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices which are continually offered year after year make perfect those who draw near okay so so th that's exactly what i was just saying right a moment ago. okay so um <clears throat> the, the, according to the law according to both the law that we see in the in the book of exodus and deuteronomy and leviticus uh, and in the the practice of the people uh, the, the law called them to sacrifice to come to jerusalem at least at passover and if if possible three or four other times throughout the year. And they would uh, make a, a, a sacrifices, and they would do that continually. Um, there's one that's particularly important one, uh, Yom Kippur. Do you know what Yom Kippur is? Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. Day of, day of atonement. And what are you making atonement for? Your sins. Your sins. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. And who are you making atonement to? God. There you go. Good, good, good. So, okay, so you, you got that down. You're, you're good Jews. Uh, so we, 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 at least once a year, would, would have a whole day. Actually, it's an eight, it's a five day, uh, an eight day process uh, where you would make atonement for your sins. But here in this letter to the Hebrews, it's saying, making it very clear that the law has only a shadow of the good things. Hmm, interesting language, isn't that? Is that yeah. referencing Plato? Very good. If you look at the footnotes, it, oh. uh, uh, Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews uh, would use some Platonic terms, but it seems here that it means a prefiguration of what is to come in Jesus. So it's just a shadow mm -hmm. of the real one. But but you're you're right. Often in in Hebrews, also in Philippians, you would see some Platonic mm -hmm. references. Yeah. So, so it's a very powerful message that this author is giving. And you can see how the people of, of, of Jerusalem at that time would consider this to be heresy. I mean, after all, that's what they did. You, you came and worshipped by sacrificing, and suddenly they're saying, well, you know, this, this really has no effect. Okay, keep going. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? 
If the worshipers had once been cleansed, they would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year after year. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Okay, so, <laughs> yes, Jeannie, that's, again, that's why I'm so glad I wasn't a priest back then. <laughs> okay, um, so, so what we'll hear on Sunday is this passage, okay? Go ahead. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings thou hast not desired, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God, okay, as stop, it is written. Stop right there. Um, <clears throat> sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. Let, let's, let's turn to... Um, and let's turn to Psalm 40. Psalm 40. What page? <laughs> that's that's on page 756. I use this as my opening prayer. Psalm 40, which... Starting with verse 7. Now I have two... My... Okay. Is it the one then I said, Lo, I come in the roll of the book it is written of me? Uh, that's verse 8. Oh. Ah. <laughs> so mine says sacrifice and offering. Right. Exactly. Right, right. Um do you see? Do you see sacrifice and offering you do not want? I do, but that's that's, that's verse six, six in mine. That's verse right. seven in mine. Yes, yes, there seven. you go. Yeah, seven. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Verse good seven in mine. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. This is fun. Um, <clears throat> remember, this number numbering is a later process, and we don't have a uniformity among the earlier versions. And so, for some of you, it will be verse six. Some of you, it will be verse seven. So start with whatever verse it is that says uh, <laughs> sacrifices and offerings you do not want. Sacrifices and offerings thou dost not desire, but thou hast given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then I said, lo, I come. In the roll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Thy law is within my heart. Okay. So here we see the original, starting with either verse 6 or verse 7, depending on which version of the, of the Bible, that we see Hebrews is using to place on our Lord's lips. Okay, so um, <clears throat> recognizing that sacrifices is not what God wants. What God wants is for us to do his will. And, and where do we see this uh, played out most clearly in Jesus' own life? the night before he was crucified. Precisely. Exactly. In the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but your mm -hmm. will be done. Okay. So consistently, Jesus comes to do the will of the Father. And it has nothing to do with sacrifices, that is, the kind of sacrifices that the people of ancient Israel were, would be accustomed to, that is, of a bull or a lamb or a turtle dove, but of themselves. Now, that's, that's a brand new message, isn't it? And one that even we today struggle with. It's much easier yeah. for us to give up give up something. Except today, we reference it every day when we say to our Father. Percent, give up, your will be done. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But don't we all struggle with that? You know, we'd much rather do our will. And in our prayers, don't we often ask God what he should do? 
rather than asking God, what do you want me to do? So um, it's, it's a whole new way of, of looking at our relationship with God that Jesus comes to offer. Back to, back to uh, Hebrews 10. Uh, Monsignor, I just wanted to say, <clears throat> my translation says Holocaust and sin offering. And I guess yours, bud, was you had burnt offerings instead of Holocaust. Yeah, yes. Well, what is a mine says Holocaust too. Yeah. What, what is a what is a Holocaust? Well, it is that, but I just it somehow in this the context of the whole thing, burnt offering seems more to the point to me. Maybe that's just my own thoughts on it. Um, Holocaust. What does the word Holocaust mean? I, I thought it meant a holy offering. Um, but his was burnt offering, I think. Well, yeah. Burnt. Yeah. Well, anyhow, it just, it's not important. Yeah, a holocaust is a sacrifice completely consumed by fire. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's the other word. It's the same word. It, I know, but somehow burnt offering seems more direct to me in the whole context of of the song. It's just a personal thought. It's not important. So. Okay, yeah, More. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so... Um, yes. and, and obviously at this point, Holocaust has a different meaning for a lot of people, so maybe that's one of the reasons why it's different. Yeah. Changed. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's it's been it's been absorbed into the whole notion mm -hmm. of the, of the exactly. Nazi... Yeah. Well, yeah. on the Jews, but yeah. it, 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 its origin is that of. <laughs> it's, right. I, I, I keep on having to laugh when I'm listening to the news uh, and watching the the, uh, the newscasters talking about all that terrible destruction uh, in the path of the tornadoes, and they talk about an entire town being decimated. Well, what does the word decimate mean? Every tenth person is killed. Exactly, exactly. So, 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 decimate is really not that bad. It's only one tenth. Of it. And, and it comes from Rome, exactly. where if when the soldiers lost a battle, they were decimated, which means every tenth one of them was killed. It, precisely, precisely. By the commander to teach precisely. them a lesson. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so, but unfortunately, we now misuse that to speak of total destruction, where it's really, it really only speaks of one tenth destruction. Anyway, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting how, how words, unfortunately, due to ignorance, become misused. But like reiterate. That, that's yeah. redundant. Reiterate <laughs> means to repeat. And I, I, that drives me nuts. Yep, 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 yep. Or when I, when I train the altar servers, it's not the credence table. It's the credence because credence means table. <laughs> Or shrimp scampi. You order shrimp scampi in, a, in, a, in an Italian restaurant. Scampi is Italian for shrimp, so you're ordering <laughs> shrimp shrimp. A double order. <laughs> well, a double order. order again. <laughs> you're reiterating. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> anyway, back to, back to Holocaust or burnt offerings, whichever one you want. Right. <laughs> Then I said, back to this, Lo, I have come to do thy will, O God, as it is written of me in the roll of the book. Then he said above, Thou hast neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Lo, I have come to do thy will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay, so this, this is heresy for the Jewish people because they, their, their entire economy and their, their entire temple worship is built on continual sacrifice. Whereas here in the letter to the Hebrews, we hear very clearly that Jesus came to offer the once and for all sacrifice. Now, it did include 
and this is very important, his offering himself on the cross for us. But it begins with his offering his will to the Father, just as Mary had done, just as any good prophet does. And so the message that we hear this weekend is that what God wants of us is to do his will because he has made us for himself. And he really knows what's best for us to begin with. But since Adam and Eve, we've been struggling to do our will and getting God to do what we want. And so the Christmas message uh, that we have this weekend is so very powerful for us. If only we would listen. Jesus came to show us in person how to do the Father's will so that we can be reunited once again with the Father who loves us all. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really good for us as we prepare to celebrate Christmas to, to reflect on that. Because I, I don't know about you, but I have to admit, in my life, I've struggled with that. You know, I, I've got a plan. Come on, God. Here's my plan. Let's do it. And I have to constantly submit myself to doing what God's will is and finding joy in that. And I have to say, it's taken me a few decades, but, but I, 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 I now am a very, very peaceful person because I know every day I submit myself to God's will. And no matter what happens, it's part of God's will. And so I can live in peace even when it's not what I wanted to do. Now, doesn't what you want to do sneak in there from time to time during the day? <laughs> Especially at Christmas time. You know? There's so much going on. There's so much going on. Yeah, well. Um... <laughs> what do you do? Get up in the morning and say, God, it, you're, it's what you want me to do today, I will do. And then you wait. Well, no, no, no. no. I have a schedule. I, I you know. I've got to celebrate mass. I've got to read, uh, pray and all that, um, and I've got all kinds of things to do. But but it's constantly being aware of that. I as God, God frequently has surprises for me. This morning I was having breakfast, and Sister Mary Elizabeth charges into the kitchen and says, um, I, "I I know you want to know this. Um, the the roof is leaking in our kitchen." Well, I really didn't want to know that. Any <laughs> <laughs> But it's just a reminder that you know God throws throws the monkey wrench in constantly. Yeah. And just kind of just kind of go with what God God has in plan for you. But but that's not to say that God has pre-planned our entire lives, is it? I mean that that to me be, says be, predestination. Yeah, be, be careful with your language there. God hasn't pre-planned our lives. God has planned our lives. We have, God has a plan for our life. And it's not predestination, it's all-knowing. So it is our task to figure out what God's plan is for us and align ourselves with it. And we choose to either do the right thing or not do the right thing. Exactly. Exactly. Monsignor, I remember several years ago seeing a sign in front of the Paoli Baptist Church. I don't know if any of you have driven by that. Oh, I love so, their signs. I love and them. notice the, the, the words of wisdom that they have. And the message was, if God says no, it's because he has a better idea. Mm-hmm. And I think of that so often. Mm-hmm. And it's been so applicable mm-hmm. so many times mm-hmm. in my mm-hmm. life. Yeah, very good. No, that's 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 a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. May I may I add one that I I found up in New Jersey at, in front of a Catholic church that I've never forgotten. When the chess game is over, the pawn and the king go back into the same box. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, so in, in this Sunday's readings, we got both Bethlehem and Jerusalem. <laughs> They, they both play a role in our salvation. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Okay, the, um, that's all I've got to say. The message is, is clear, if, if only we were willing to listen, okay? Any one one quick commercial. Yes. I went to uh, Radio City yesterday to, to ostensibly see the Rockettes, and I was shocked in a really good way. They devoted a good 15 minutes 
to the whole birth of Jesus story. It was it was oh, really yeah. I was surprised. Well, they've done that for years. Oh, I, I know. I, but in this thing, day and age, that's amazing. It's one thing <laughs> to see it in 1965. It's another thing to see it in 2001. It, yeah. it really, as I said, shocked me in a good way that they would be so out front with it. I mean, I thought, yeah, I've seen it. This is my third time seeing it. I saw it when I was 10. I saw it when I was like 50. Yeah. And I've seen it now when I'm 95. <laughs> <laughs> but but what, 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 it was, what you're saying is that they're still doing it. Yeah, that's still that doing it. And it was wonderful. really, it was really great because it put everything, obviously there's a ton of Santa Claus there, but it really put everything in perspective. They had the three kings, everybody bowed, got on their knees. It was really affirming. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's thank you. I'm, I'm glad they're still doing that because you're right. It's been about 20 years since I saw it and I'm, yeah. I'm glad they're still doing it. Yeah. yeah. I got to re relate something I said this week. Uh, I don't know why they, they obviously misjudge people, but I was contacted to uh, as an expert. And that's why I, was, I laughed at them, but <laughs> I'm not an expert, but they asked me to comment on uh, on how to stay within your budget at Christmas time. And I responded and, and it's, online somewhere now and but, but but a capsule of what I said was and I like to make a play on words of presence and presence okay is uh one of the ways to save money is to go back to the original meaning of Christmas and realize the presence of God at our midst is much more valuable than the presence you give or receive very nice for you good for you perfect <laughs> and uh so one other thing you said earlier and, and this is not me 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. I've commented before when I told you the joke I made up to the other to the priest at Villanova when I said I'm, I'm cramming for my final at my age. I've, I've done a lot of reflecting as I've gotten old, gotten older and stuff. Uh, is when you mentioned you God's you know does stuff unexpected, and I realized about about 10 years ago when I've been starting to really think a lot about uh, my religion and my faith and stuff, that God never does anything unexpected for me anymore because I realized that I'm just a person. For, for God to do something unexpected, that's me thinking I'm as smart as God is. And I should never have, and, and part, of, part of the things I've learned about other things, I just, you just if, you, if you have added addicts in your life, you shouldn't have expectations for them because they have a different journey they're on. And I just realized that for my faith, I don't have expectations of God because I cannot, anyway think like he does i mean i'm a reasonably smart person i think but i'm not i'm like this smart compared to god and so i never have expectations of god mm -hmm. because i figure he, he knows a lot better than i know so uh, that's just a personal growth that i've had i think over the last 15 years yeah thank you so much thank you so, that's, that's a very important tidbit of wisdom yeah yeah good laura um Remember last week we were talking about the quote from Elizabeth Ann Seton? I, I found it and I wanted to share it with everybody. Um, the quote is, the first end I propose in our daily work is to do the will of God. Secondly, to do it in the manner he wills it. And thirdly, to do it because it is his will. Mm. Yep. yep, absolutely. Yeah, very, very powerful. Yeah. And then the other quote, that I think is apropos, um, I think, to what Jean said. Um, it's from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. God will either give us what we ask or what he knows to be better for us. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the great present we receive is Jesus himself, who through his life shows us that the true happiness comes from doing the Father's will. Now, if Jesus, who is God himself, can submit to the Father's will, it's a pretty good lesson for all of us. So we should do that as well. So I, I wish all of you a, a very, very blessed Christmas. I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Okay. Good. Merry Thank Christmas to all. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it as was, it was in the beginning, is now, and ever will be. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Good Christmas, people. everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Healthy, happy New Year. Yes. And blessings. Yeah. Lots of blessings. Amen. Monsignor, can I ask you a question? Sure. No, no one else would be interested in this, but I think in a new year, 